Cross the margin. Cross the margin. Podcast. Where we take you beyond the margin, behind the scenes of the online magazine, and deeper into the stories. I'm your host, Michael Shields, and this episode is a big one for us, as it does mark our 50th journey beyond the margin. And with that in mind, I want to commence with a healthy serving of gratitude. I want to thank everyone out there who spends time with us, who uh, listens to the podcast and, and supports us in any way. I mean, you are the the fuel for our, to our fire, and, 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 you know, I just really, I can't thank you enough for, for listening and, and going along with us on, on these journeys. I want to thank all the amazing guests. Uh, I'm, I'm personally continually humbled and, and awed by the brilliant minds and, and storytellers who, who continually make this podcast so special. It's, um, it's, it's just remarkable who we've had on, and I can't wait to see where this goes. And thank you just to everyone involved, the uh, Special shout out to my former co-host Chris Thompson, uh, and just anyone who 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 helps me with this, and, and you know who you are. It's been a, it's been a tremendous fifty, and uh, and, and and what's so cool, and in so many ways, this this whole thing has has just begun. So stay tuned. We're we're gonna keep cranking them out, um, and and starting with today, we got we got a really uh, special episode, uh, one that's deeply insightful and captivating, and. And but before we get into that, I just want to remind you that we are part of the Osiris Podcast Network. Uh, go to osirispod.com to check out a whole slew of uh, amazing podcasts. There's a lot of music podcasts over there. There's there's comedy podcasts, a couple new ones. Um, there's a great history podcast over there, The Road to Now, that I, I celebrate often. Um, just just check it out, osirispod.com. Today, we are going to talk Russia, um, and in that way, this is a very, very important interview, uh, episode, pardon me. Um, we're going to tackle one of the most pressing concerns of modern times, and that is Russia's influence in the United States' 2016 presidential election and its ongoing sway on the president of the United States. Um, to accomplish this, uh, you know, and to really dive in, I am fortunate enough to feature an interview with um, uh, the director, the writer, the producer of a documentary called Active Measures. Uh, Active Measures is a documentary which exposes a 30-year history of covert political warfare devised by Vladimir Putin to disrupt, influence, and ultimately control world events. Uh, It's it's an amazing, amazing documentary. documentary and that filmmaker is Jack Bryan um, and he uh, you'll see in this interview he um, through the research involved in in you know in preparing for this documentary he's done such a, a amazing job of connecting all these dots it's it's wild as you'll notice in this interview if you, when you check out the film all that is um, all that, all that's at play here. It's, I mean, we're not talking just recent events around to the election of 2016, but um, Jack goes way back to, uh, you know, the the Russia's early meddlings um, in, in in other countries that are very similar to what they have done here in America. Uh, the early days of Trump, um, in the early days of Trump's relationship with Russia. Uh, you know, we, we we aim to in this episode, and what the film does is unravel the true depths of the and scope of the Russia story. It's uh it's 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 just wild. It's jaw dropping and I mean it, it, all the cyber attacks, the propaganda campaign campaigns we'll talk about, just the uh just the corruption overall and and and, and what Brian's uh, uh, what 
what um what his film does is is really, you know, it, it gives a rich context for uh, Russia's interference and and traces the history of its its kind of shrewd uh, geo uh, political machinations. It's um. It's awesome. The, the film, Talking to Jack, was awesome. Um, I could go on, on and rave about the film. Go see it. Um, and um, hopefully you get a good taste of what's in that film with this interview I have right now with Jack Bryan. I'm so glad you were pumped to do this. This is great. And uh, bravo on the film. It's, it's, uh, I, it's, it's incredible. The... The comprehensiveness and it's so eye-opening. Uh, just bravo, man! It's great. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. So let's dig in. I don't want to waste any of your time, but uh, I, I want to ask to commence. Um, just how involved the process of making this film was, and, and all the research behind it. I mean, what active measures amounts to is an expose of, you know, a thirty-year history of Russia's Russia's covert political warfare plot to control world events there's there's a lot of dots to connect here and and you do it so thoroughly how uh how difficult was this to piece together yeah it was uh it was really difficult um i mean it was difficult but it was also exciting and invigorating and you know every day we would find new things and that that really is what keeps you going in this context where uh you know we would always have a moment at the end of the day where we would go from being like kind of um, exuberant, really, you know, uh, feeling like we really like almost got like a great workout to yeah. just really letting all the information actually kind of just soak over us and then we get really depressed. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh no, <laughs> everything we uncovered was actually really pretty horrifying. Yeah, it's scary. It's scary. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so there was a lot of that, but but really that was, I think to an extent that was, the movie might not have happened without that because in um, March of last year, I kind of, the idea of the film kind of came to me as, as something that really needed to happen. And I had already at that point uh, with my, one of my producers is sort of my election buddy. We were throughout the election, we were texting and mm-hmm. emailing about the election. Oh, I got an election um, buddy, yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so uh, by March, though, I realized if that nobody but us would be able to do this in time for the midterms because it did take so much research. And even at that point, we already knew a lot. And we were like, we need to do about a month of research. And any filmmaker that would have been able to raise the money or get access to the people that we thought we'd be able to get access to uh, would have needed to start then and do months and months of research at that point. So because of that, a massive amount of of, uh of research that was needed, we kind of realized that nobody else was going to be able to do this. Yeah, um, and so that that was one of the impetuses for really making the film. It's unbelievable that it just started, kind of came uh, came to you to do this last March, and and then we have this piece of art, which is Active Measures. Let me. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak broadly about the idea of Active Measures and how they are employed by Russia. Uh, what is it that Russia is using specifically as tools of warfare, if uh, if not their military might? Yeah, so this is, um, it's sort of a combination of, of very old techniques and very new ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, the old techniques is, is sort of the, the underlying motivation, uh, which was used by the Soviet Union. They use the term active measures uh, and just actions of political warfare that are uh, surreptitious, which aren't direct. So mm-hmm. they'll find, you know, uh, groups that are sort of more uh, separatist in nature or more ex- more fringe um in nature and they will you know pump some money towards them and they will try to infiltrate them and they will try to push them to their extremes Mm. and the um and and you know they do this to groups that you and people that like you and i might like or groups of people you and i might not like yeah so uh in the 70s and 60s they were doing this with the black panthers it doesn't mean the black panthers was a bad organization Mm. or evil organization it just means that there was a, a they were trying to push it to the more extreme. They're they're in there, and what they would do within these networks is they would see conspiracy theories. Mm. And so, one example that was sort of prevalent in the seventies was that the CIA or the government, U.S. government, invented the AIDS virus. It spread it through black communities. Oh wow! Uh, and that's actually still a very common conspiracy theory yeah. in certain you know uh, networks in, in America. I've heard of that. I never realized the source. Oh yeah, no, that was, and you can find the sort of the there's a lot of research on that there's a lot of people that sort of have come out and talked about mm-hmm. that how that was conceived of and written in the kgb office wow. um and so what changed in a big way though was social media yeah 
because as opposed to them having to get somebody in the country, hand them a pan flip or have some in into that network, what they can do is they can just pay people to like everything that you post, to retweet it, to repost it. And then after about a year or two, that person, you consider that person part of your network, Mm -hmm. part of who you listen to, part of who you believe, and then they start seeding Russia propaganda. And so it's given them a much bigger platform to do the things that they were already trying to do. It's wild. And it's, you guys, uh, you touch on it on the film, how they prey on uh, Westerners' inclinations and and laziness. It's, there was, there's a savvy there in in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a large part of that is that you know, Eastern Europe is is not exactly, I wouldn't say used to it, but they've had experience with it. You know, like um, a lot, one of the, the more fun things after a screening of the film is when, you know, older Eastern European, you know, men and women come up to us and go, I, that is everything I have saw in my childhood is uh-huh. on the screen. <laughs> you know, like that is exactly what we saw. That is exactly what we've been dealing with um, for years. Wow. And it's it's true. In fact, Russians too. I mean, Putin practiced active measures on his own population mm. before he did them on other people or other countries. So it was um, th- these are all mechanisms that are used internally and then refined abroad and then perfected in America. Wow. Yeah, because I mean, you do. Um, it, it, it spoke of this uh, this game plan um, prior to the engagement with America. They they employed a unique methodology in other countries. And I was wondering if you could talk about this uh, this playbook they used in, in Astoria and I believe later in Georgia. And it's mm-hmm. kind of, uh, what, what happened there? Yeah, so I, I think what's important to consider about um, the 2016 presidential operation mm-hmm. is that that was not the first time they had done it. And they it was after they had tried that operation of fixing election or attacking election, foreign election, uh, and then they had worked on that and refined that in other countries and realized they could do it and then brought it here. Mm. Almost the exact same playbook. And now the, the reason that they did it um, in um, America seems to be that they just – or actually anywhere. I mean, if you look at Georgia, if you look at Ukraine, countries where they were doing this. Initially the impetus was, hey, you know, we're invading these countries and that's expensive. Mm. They invaded Georgia in 2008. It exposed their military. It was relatively weak. It was incredibly expensive. It made them look bad on the world stage. Yeah. And so they were like, wait a second, maybe there's an easier way to achieve these goals. Maybe there's an easier way to get all of the benefits of invading a country mm-hmm. without the downside of invading a country. Mm-hmm. And so they started pushing for financing candidates that were generally extreme right, almost always anti-immigration, um, anti uh, progressiveness, you know, uh, as far as LGBT rights, um, and they would run campaigns wherein they would uh, the Russians would push a lot of uh, fake news on social media, and then they would get a candidate, usually a very wealthy guy who had no experience in politics, um, to repeat those talking points. And they did this in Georgia. They did this all over the place. Um, and because people are seeing it on their feeds. Or in Eastern Europe, sometimes it's pamphleting. And then there's only one candidate talking, saying those things. It makes that candidate sound like he's the only one telling the truth. Oh, wow. And so it's this amazingly effective campaign. Uh, and they've been refining it and doing it for a while. And they got very, very good at it. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, I really I respect the savviness in some ways. And, and, and sure. you know, knowing knowing what's in their wheelhouse, what they're capable of. It's it's. Yeah. No, I mean, for, for a country that has an incredibly small economy. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a smaller economy than Italy and South Korea. Oh, wow. Um, individually, so I think it's the, the 12th or 14th uh, largest. Mm-hmm. And so for a country that has now listen, it also has the largest oil reserves in the world. Yeah. Um, but and they've stolen so much money out of that country that it has a median income of India. Um, wow. But it's um, but they have for not having that much power, they just have a bunch of nukes, not a great military. Yep. They have outweighed control over the world right. or within the world. I mean, they certainly outweighed influence, outweighed control. It, it is very savvy. Um, and but it's also I, I think it's important to know that these are acts of desperation internally. Okay. Russia is is having serious problems. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they've, I mean, uh, we talk about income inequality in America, and it's a really serious issue. Sure, but in Russia, a hundred people own forty percent of the country's wealth. That's just insane. Yeah, so it's it's a different thing completely yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as a result, like 
you can't have thriving cities if everybody's poor. Absolutely. And so the the in, internally Russia is really bleak, and nobody who has any education wants to live there. Mm-hmm. And as a result, like the economy, especially with the energy prices coming down over the last few years, the economy there is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and so now Putin's popularity is in serious, serious risk because they're going to have to raise uh, the retirement age past the average male life expectancy. Wow. Um, um, and that is, and people are not happy with that. Yeah, I mean, these aren't um, at, what we're talking about. These aren't at, attributes for uh, long-term uh, success in any way. That's crazy. Yeah, certainly. certainly. So, uh, and I think that they just thought the energy markets were going to rise forever. Yeah, and maybe they could have gotten away with it, but yeah. it's, it's a mess over there now. Yeah, that's going to change. So let's um, let's get to Trump because we have to. Uh, oh, indeed, of course, yes. Active, me- <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, but active measures does an amazing job highlighting just how perfect a mark he was for the Russians. Um, and I urge all the listeners once again to dive in to the film and find out the whole story here. It's, it's, it's wild. But, uh, but uh, what is it that did make Trump the perfect mark? Well, what made him the perfect mark at different times were kind of different things. Mm-hmm. So it made him, so we sort of see almost four or sorry, three main sections to his relationship with Russia. Cause like any relationship that anybody has, didn't develop overnight yes over time and it changed Mm -hmm. and so initially in 1984 when trump meets with the russian mobster david bogadin and sells him five condos in trump tower yeah in a deal that this data attorney general letter calls money laundering um, yeah that's like the first illegal act uh, that you can pinpoint right exactly their first clear line of illegality yeah at at that point he just is a, a guy who owns a building which is only the second building in new york that where shell companies can purchase units. So for the Russian mafia, which acts as a branch of the Russian government, it's those those hundred guys who've stolen all that money from the country, mm-hmm. really, and really a, a few more than hundred, but not that many more. Mm-hmm. They need they want to get that money out of the country. Mm-hmm. They don't want that money sitting in a Russian bank. Mm-hmm. It's it's you know it's for many reasons, uh, and so they use the Russian mafia to launder that money into America. And so anytime and the Russian mob has an opportunity to launder money for somebody good for them they're happy about it mm. so that that continues and there's there sort of seems to be a fair amount of that going on but maybe more than you would see in the average real estate um empire or, or company but not, not not it's not institutional within it and then in the early 90s uh and through 2004 trump goes through a long series of bankruptcies uh, and at that point, he becomes incredibly enticing to them. Mm. First, because he needs them. He can't get seat capital for his. He can't even. He's not even at this point really uh, leasing out his name. So he's he's got to figure out some way to get money. Uh, banks won't loan to him. Uh, two, he's he's really famous, mm-hmm. and he's no one's going to question a lot of money going into his organization, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, regardless of how many times he's gone through bankruptcy. Uh, and he was also down. He was willing. They knew that he was willing to do this stuff. He'd been doing it for a while. And so at that point, when they move in and they become his sort of chief financer, the Russian mafia, that is, uh, he is already displayed that he is he's open. He's, he's game. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, he is he is really the perfect mark. Uh, and now as things progress, at that point, you know, this is 2004. At that point, the Russians aren't – they're doing a little bit of election meddling. That In Ukraine in 2004, they do – they try to rig an election. They hack the vote. Um, but it is not a massive part of what they're doing. They're not financing far-right candidates all over the globe. Yeah. Uh, and so as Trump's relationship with them starts to develop, they start getting more involved in politics. Uh, and he again becomes the perfect mark for them. And that wealthy guy, very very famous, but no political history, mm-hmm. uh, and also has since 2007 has been saying very lovely things about Putin on TV, probably because he's helping them launder money and he wants that relationship with the Kremlin, uh, and also mm-hmm. he's trying to develop relationships with, with oligarchs, mm-hmm. um, and so all of that puts him as this perfect person to go forward with these operations on. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, you mentioned the different inclinations of their relationship, but I mean, when they first, you know, kind of targeted him, uh, I mean, there can't be any way that they imagined this mark would work out in the manner that it did, that he would, you know, raise to be president at some point. Or... I could, couldn't imagine they did. And, and, and really, that, but that would not be unusual. I mean, what, okay. what they do, I mean, even if you look at the 2016 operation, mm-hmm. What the way that they work is they say, let's put a situation to effect where no matter what happens, we win. Mm-hmm. 
So if Donald Trump had lost, they still would have won. Yeah. Because he would have managed to call into question so many basic norms of how we interact politically. He would have called into the question the election vote. He would yeah. have said it was rigged. And he would have thrown up so much dirt that it would have really hamstrung, hamstrung a, a Clinton presidency. Yeah, yeah. And, and that alone would have made it worth it. Absolutely. It's accomplishing some of their goals, which is uh, division and watching democracy crumble from the inside out. That Absolutely. absolutely. It would have worked. Um, you touched on it just a, uh, just a bit ago about uh, Trump Tower and we were talking about the 1984 sale. But uh, in the film, it is described as a money launders paradise. And it's crazy everything that was going on there. Can you speak on that just a little bit? Yeah, it really is very, very strange. I mean, just to take a couple of incidents. Um, I mean, I, for me, I think the one that, that has the most question marks is the largest Russian uh, gambling ring. Yeah. <laughs> which was mob gambling, which was run out of Trump That's crazy. For a number of years, yeah. Um, and with the, the head of that, when, when that ring gets busted after, you know, I mean, when Donald Trump says he was his. Trump Tower was wiretapped. He's right. The FBI wiretapped Trump Tower because mm-hmm. there was a massive Russian mafia ring yeah. operating inside of it. Uh, and so when they busted that ring up, the head of it moves to Russia and lives there today very comfortably. Um, and yeah, and, and also there's just, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's not just Trump Tower, but even within Trump Tower, you have, you know, Yasov Ivankov, who's a. Uh, uh, the head of the Russian mafia in New York. It lives in lived in Trump Tower for a while. Also, spent a lot of time in Trump Taj Mahal mm-hmm. uh, at the Trump casinos. Those were big Russian mob hangouts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also within Trump Tower is I think the the most the shadiest of the organizations related to him is is um, Bayrock. Yep. And that, yep. that starts at least the space in Trump Tower in two thousand two and two thousand four is when they really start doing the deal with Trump. And that seems to be just a, a straight Russian mob organization where the Russian government, basically, as these guys are laundering money into America, the Russian government wants to know where the money is going, yeah. at least. And so they use these these organizations called NIT, which are law enforcement calls them nodes. When it comes to money laundering, where it's a you know, organization where a ton of money funnels through, and and so that's that's the, those are the guys that can handle basic laundering. Uh, and Bayrock appears to be one of those. Uh, and also appears to be a company that is raising uh, Russian or post-Soviet money for these properties to be built in the first place. Uh, and so I would say that those are those would be the top of the list. I would say of sketchy, sketchy organizations within um, Ru- Russian mob organizations within it's, the Trump Tower itself. It's just it just it's truly mind blowing. Like like your film, all that is going on and all that EPC. It's just I mean, right when you were just t- explaining all that, my jaw is kind of just dropping. It's crazy, but um. <laughs> Yeah, that was my that was my year the last year and a half. A lot of a lot of jaw dropping moments. Where it's just like, wait, am I I'm reading this wrong? Yeah, this is right? this real, and it is yeah. real, and that's what's so insane. Yeah. And that's what's so important about your work here. Um, but uh, in active measures, you do you feature interviews with extremely high profile politicians, and you know we're talking Hillary Clinton, John McCain, um, and I found it remarkable just how. Yeah, and it's appropriate, but uh, how exasperated and, and angry uh, they were. Were, were they? Um, how was it getting them on board? Were they because they had so much passion about the issue? Were they pretty, um, you know, kind of excited to jump in? How was it working with Hillary and John? It was great. I mean, yeah. they're they're amazing. They're both brilliant, and they've also been really great on this issue. Uh, I mean, at least since two thousand four. Yeah. I mean, that they have both. They were both in Ukraine together after uh, Putin attacked that election, yeah. tried to rig it. Uh, and so I think that they, at that moment, if not before that, really figured out who this guy was. Yeah. Uh, and so they were essential. I mean, n- nobody else in the U.S. government, I think, would be more successful than those two in terms of people that really knew what the threat was there. Yeah. Uh, it was great. I mean, the it was it certainly took uh, several steps to get to them. And uh, sure. we they looked at who we interviewed beforehand, and in some cases... Uh, talk to those people and um, so it was just you know it was um, it was uh, it was really good I mean it was yeah. it was difficult I mean we, we definitely we definitely had a conversation with the people and they're like what did the, we you know ask them what they thought of us and uh, they one for example John McCain we 
uh, first interview with Discovery Richard Fontaine, who had written mm-hmm. a lot of his policy mm-hmm. up to that point. And, um, and so they knew that we weren't try- just trying to get us through some crazy conspiracy thing. We were really trying to tell a serious story. And, uh, and with each of them, we talked, you know, about, uh, about Putin for a good, you know, 30 minutes before we even got to uh, Trump. Oh, wow. And so at that point, I think that they understood that this was really trying to understand the full context of this yeah, and not just make an anti-Trump, you know, hate piece. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that's what's so special about after the message, I think it really puts everything into context. Um, I want to ask you about um, Paul Manafort uh, uh, briefly, as he's a huge part of this Russian web of deceit here. I still can't get over that. Was it 600,000 a month from the pro-Putin party in Ukraine? Was that what he was getting? Yeah, 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 that's and that's just from the party. I mean, he was getting. I mean, he had a ten million dollar year contract with Oleg Deripaska to represent Russian interests Crazy. in both Europe and America. Crazy. So, uh, you know, just in light of all the recent news of his cooperation with the Mueller investigation, based on all you've learned, I mean, that has to be a uh, a huge deal, right? Oh yeah, I mean the uh, well the, the the his flipping is, yeah you mean, you mean, oh yeah that, oh, that absolutely. Just, oh my gosh yeah yeah that's the biggest, that was that's the biggest day in this whole thing I agree I mean it's quietly that is by far the I mean in my opinion the biggest day yeah because I mean because, as, as you've shown yeah. he's I mean he's been there from I mean nearly day one on this thing but also he was Putin's election rigger yeah for years yeah so. He knows. I mean, he was. I mean, one of the things that I think is amazing in the court filings that have come out through this and, and, and through the um, through the his, his confession is that he was working in anti Hillary Clinton campaigns since about 2012. Crazy in Ukraine uh, because of her support for a woman uh, who we talk about pretty extensively in the film, Ahilia Tymoshenko, yep. who he was running almost nice. the same campaign they ran in 2016. Doesn't. Um, Ten against her, yeah, and so it's um, yeah. So Manafort knows all on this one. At least not, maybe not on the money laundering in Trump Tower, yeah. but Michael Cohen does. Yep. Uh, Michael yeah. Cohen, the guy that ran Bayrock, Felix Sater. Yeah. He and Michael Cohen were teenage friends together. Crazy. Yeah, um, between Paul and um, and and him, I mean, there's there's a lot that's going to come out. Yeah. It's wild. absolutely. We're on the brink of something. I have a quick question about uh, kind of food chain thing. So many roads in this film lead back to, I'm about to butcher his name, and I apologize, Simeon uh, Mogilevich? Mogilevich, yeah. Mogilevich. Yeah. Simeon, the, the, the brainy Don, yeah. Yeah, is, I mean, is he, is he at the top of this food chain? He seems like the one of the, he's the big time crime boss over there. It's, it's, it's he running things, Putin run things. I was trying to piece that together a little bit. Oh, I would say I would say if you want to look at the top of the food chain on this whole thing, you, you have to look to Putin. Okay, it's a good. But yeah. also, right. it depends what which food chain we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, really, at the end of the day, uh, Mogilevich, who is the Russia's biggest mobster, mm-hmm. he lives openly in Russia because Putin allows him to live openly yeah. in Russia. Yeah. Uh, he runs the largest gas trade in the world, which is the Russia Ukraine gas trade. All the gas that comes into Europe travels through Ukraine you can't and there's no other way for it to go through and the guy that controls that is Semyon Mogilevich the head of the Russian mafia uh, he's also he's a super powerful guy his lawyer is uh, William Sessions the former head of the FBI yep. uh, he is has very deep reach but he only and he manages he, he is the money laundering kingpin he launders hundreds of millions of dollars if not billions of dollars every year uh, and, but the only reason he can do that is because Putin lets him. Yep. Now, when you look at the, um, for example, the, the mob really entering Trump, uh, the Trump organization, Trump Tower, I don't think Putin even knew about that. Oh, wow. But I think Semyon did. Yeah. And what we have heard was that uh, it was sort of 2004. Because, I mean, Semyon Mogilevich has an economics degree. He has been the biggest money launderer since the 1980s. Oh. He knows how to do this. Yeah. And so he was apparently the one who looked at uh, Trump's 2004 bankruptcy filings and said, oh, we got this guy. This is him, yep. Yeah, we got this guy. Wow. And so I think that, that in that operation, he was certainly the lead. I, I don't know that he was in direct communication with anybody, but I think that he made the call. Um, and he, I mean, he, he was, he doesn't, you know, he's not like coming to America and being like, you go there, you go there. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, I, I think most of his stuff is done over, you know, distant communication. Um, but yeah, I think so. I think that he was certainly had that operation. But I think that 
that that when the operation became political, I think he probably had very little to do with that. Um, some, I, I think that you can connect a lot of it to him because a lot of these guys who are in this network launder their money for Mogilevich uh, or work with him in some capacity, especially the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian gas trade. Yeah. So uh, even when you look at some of the political stuff, it touches Mogilevich, mm-hmm. but I don't know that he's directing it. I think he was, he was in effect directing the, the money laundering aspect of it. But I think Putin and his people kind of really took the lead on the election attack. Yeah, he's pressing the buttons there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what's so, that's something so fascinating. And you know, I, I mentioned multiple times how comprehensive Active Measures is, and it just getting to know you know a lot of these people behind the scenes. It's it's really really wonderful done. I hate to ask you to speculate as we wind down here, but uh, I know I mean you must be so heavily invested in. Mm-hmm. And in this story now, I mean, uh, where do you see this going? What, um, what, what, what's next? And what's next for you as well? I, I mean, this is such a great film. I'd love to see, um, you know, what, what you're doing uh, in, in, in the future here. Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to speculate because okay. uh, f- f- fully, f- fully aware that I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything. Yep. Uh, I should also add, I didn't think Donald Trump was going to win the election Me in the too. first place, so I, I don't I say who I know. Is, I admit that readily as well. Uh, I also didn't think that the first man of, or, or the first Mueller indictments were going to come down until late spring, and they mm-hmm. went. They came down four months before that, five months yeah. before that. So, I I have been wrong on timing. <laughs> I have been wrong on who's it. But that all having been said, yeah. uh, my guess is that Trump's out by this time next year. Yep. Um, that I, I think that over the next sometime before this January. Mm-hmm. I would say my, my gut is, is that you're not, I don't know if he's going to let the election affect the pace of things that are going to happen. Yeah. Um, but he might not, he might not see anybody else indicted until the election. I don't know. But I think by, by December, or January, you're going to have from many different courts, not just Mueller, several different charges, all of which at least named Trump or many of which, at least named Trump as an unindicted co-conspirator. Mm-hmm. I think that it, you, the political pressure is going to actually be, I think it's going to be harder for Republicans to vote against impeachment than it will for Democrats to vote for it. Or, yeah. Because I think that just the public sentiment will be very different by then. Um, and I think that he's out. I think he's out. I, I mean, I, there's just so much. There's, it, listen, if I was able to find that much, yep. Mueller's going to be able to find 10 times that. Absolutely. Because he's got... Uh, aside from the fact that he's the Babe Ruth of prosecutors <laughs> and FBI agents, yeah. he is also just has access to all the information. Yeah. No, I mean, after I was just finished watching uh, Active Measures for the first time, I was just, it made so much sense, while, you know, while Mueller's, Mueller's still, you know, at it. I mean, there is so much to sift through. And and, uh, and you guys did such an amazing job, this film. I find it, you know, I find it so important. Um, I couldn't recommend it more. It's 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 really it's it's incredible. It's eye opening, and uh, I I couldn't thank you more for taking the time to talk to me about it. Well, thank you so much for having me on your show, and uh, you know, people can obviously check it out on iTunes yep. and uh, Hulu as well. You know, Hulu, right? Hulu, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Amazon. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, we just we hope hoping to get the word out there. And no doubt. Because really, I mean, people sort of ask us, like, you know, are Trump supporters going to see this? And, and the answer is probably not. Yeah, they and should. For, uh, they, yeah, they should. But, yeah. but I think that the, the, the answer for reaching them is that we really want to talk to the middle. Yeah. And let, let rational or even the, the left, but, but the, also the middle and really rational people who are interested in things like you talk about on this show of just like, what's the real answer? Like what's yeah. really going on here? We don't have to worry about just kicking up dust, but really want to know what's actually happening mm-hmm. and talking to those people and, and allowing them to be like, to understand like, this is really important. Yeah. This is actually dangerous and this really needs to be addressed and allowing that message to carry over to the far right, yeah. just a sort of rippling over as opposed to directly talking to those people because they're not going to see the film. Yeah. That's a cool way to think about it, though. You know, get the facts out there as you know, as readily as we can and, um, you know, hope they drift in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Jack, this was great. I, I couldn't appreciate this more. Uh, thank you again. And, and everyone out there, get out there and see Active Measures. It's absolutely incredible. Thanks, Jack. Thanks so much. Yeah. Osiris. This podcast is in the loop. The Legion of Osiris podcasts. What does that mean? Osiris is a community of great music and culture podcasts. If you like this one, go check out others at osirispod.com and get in the loop. Osiris has partnered 
with Relics Magazine at relics.com.